Hello and welcome to Boston Magazine's Tastes, presented by Stella Artois. I'm Scott Kernan, food and entertainment editor here at Boston Magazine, and I am thrilled to be with you all tonight. Now, as you may know, we have reimagined our annual taste program. Uh, in this year, we can't gather together to dine in person in the way we used to, so we've gone virtual in order to align with our November issue that highlights 25 restaurants where you need to eat right now. In addition to that, we have also introduced our Taste Passport program. Now, this is an opportunity for you to receive deals and discounts at 60 plus local restaurants. They're offering them exclusively to Taste Passport owners, and you can get those through Boston Magazine. It's brought to you by Maker's Mark, and once you have your passport, you can access these deals through the end of the year. Your support of these restaurants throughout the winter months ahead could be the difference that keeps them with their doors open or unfortunately adds them to the list of restaurants that have not been able to make it through this pandemic that we've been enduring. To that point, the proceeds from your purchase of the Taste Passport will be donated directly to Mass Restaurants United, which is a coalition formed by independent hospitality professionals to advocate for the industry and plan solutions to survive, repair, and rebuild in this time of COVID-19 and beyond. We'll continue to sell these tickets throughout the next six weeks, so please urge your friends and family to pick up their pass if they haven't already. Now, tonight I will be joined by acclaimed chef and TV host Giovanna Heike of La Fabrica Central, a Latin Caribbean restaurant located in Cambridge's Central Square. You know her from an array of dazzling accomplishments, from half a dozen cookbooks to restaurants in the U.S. and Puerto Rico, to her iconic TV show, Giovanna's Kitchen, that ran for 23 years in Puerto Rico. She is not nicknamed the Julia Child of Puerto Rico for nothing, all right? I know <laughs> that you're going to love her. She's an amazing chef, a very warm soul. But before we get to this amazing cooking demo that she has for us, a quick word from our taste sponsor, Maker's Mark. It's not easy crafting the distinctive full flavor taste of Maker's Mark. Getting all our water from our very own limestone filtered lake. Getting red winter wheat instead of the usual rye from this one family farm. And aging to taste by constantly sipping bourbon. Wait. All this sounds pretty nice, actually. No wonder we've been doing it this way for so long. This season, give our best to yours. All right, welcome back to Boston Magazine's Taste. I am joined now by Chef Giovanna Heke of La Fabrica Central in Cambridge's Central Square. Giovanna, how are you? Good, good. Scott, it's so good to see you. How are you doing? You as well. I wish it was in person, but we will be reunited over some cocktails and delicious food very soon, Definitely. I have no doubt. <laughs> yes. We are thrilled to have you with us tonight. Thanks for taking the time. There's so much for restaurants to be doing right now. Um, but you are a pro at what we're about to see this whole uh tv cooking world you had your own television show that ran for many years for folks who aren't familiar with it tell us just a little bit about your approach to puerto rican cuisine and how you've shared that with folks in the course of your career well one of the things that i love about puerto rican cuisine is based on what we grow so it's based in everything that you can see in the island and it's just done in such a way because our food really started in the cauldrons of mothers and grandmothers that just wanted to feed their families with that whatever they had in the backyard but they wanted to do it with a lot of flavor and that's something that you can see in all of our cuisine in the show, it was different in a certain way because when I started cooking, which was a long time ago, most of my friends were starting to have kids, but they were women, they were professionals, they were handling very big budgets, but they couldn't go to the supermarket. They didn't have any idea about cooking. So when I started the TV show, for one month, all I wanted to do, oh, let me bring all the classics, let, let's get what the restaurants are doing and tell them all the secrets. And then I found out, how am I going to talk about exotic recipes if they don't know anything about the first thing about cooking? So it ended up being 
one of those shows that wanted to say, okay, this is a tomato, how you pick it, how you save it, how you cut it, how you do it. And I started even having TV shows saying, okay, this is the way to do a shopping list. Go through the order of the things while you're going through the supermarket. That way you won't leave everything and you won't be running around. And then I had kids. So when you have kids, the whole thing about be careful with the souffle, don't open the oven, take care, that went out the window. You know, when you have kids, an emergency can happen in two seconds. So I changed from getting my whole hands in the batter to just one hand in case one emergency happened and I had one clean hand always working for me. So one of the things that happened was the recipes were 35 minutes long you could take very little and i was always very keen about having substitution on everything that we were doing it didn't matter what budget you had it didn't matter how many stores you had and also when you have kids you don't have time to go to three different stores to get ingredients so you, i was trying to make something simple and i was talking really to the friends that i grew up with that had no idea about cooking <laughs> That, well, I have to tell you, everything that you're describing seems like the perfect kind of cooking for the moment that we're in. When you have folks who don't necessarily um, have a humongous food budget right now, right? They might be uh, parents that are at home with their kids and they need to just be able to work in the cooking wherever they can make it happen with all the dis other distractions that are going on. So this is the yeah. perfect time to be learning from an expert like you. Well, one of the things that I enjoyed a lot with the show is that sometimes we had um, calls at the same time that I was cooking. So I was always able to answer. And we, we weren't able to do that because I started with a live and then recording. We would stay after the show was shown. I would stay on the phone just answering questions. I love to learn from people because also people would call me and say, you know, my mom does it like that. One thing we got to understand about cooking is that no recipe is written in stone. Actually, they are evolving organic things. You have to make it your own. You have to make it for the people that you are serving at that moment, which is your family. And one of the things that I enjoy now when I see everything that's going on with food and TV and, and the media is when we started, we were all our different um, compartments of the show. We were our research. We were our prep. We were our buyers. We were everything which is what people do in their kitchen. So I hope that I can bring that honesty when I'm cooking and doing it through the TV. <laughs> and when we started, there was not even food, food um, channel. So it was really uh, an, an uncharted kind of way of doing it. It was only Julia Child and I was a fan of her. So of course, that's why I was so excited when I was called the Julia Child, but it's really because I, we, I was one of the first in Puerto Rico. <laughs> well, you know, uh, as, as much of a compliment it is to be called the Julia Child of Puerto Rico, I love Giovanna Heike. That's who I'm here to see, okay? And I, I do love the fact that, that you are in Cambridge now, which is where Julia Child um, spent so much of, of her life. What has it been like um, to have a restaurant in Cambridge? What, what brought you here? brought me the idea of the restaurant because when they called me that they were going to open a restaurant, they wanted to do traditional Caribbean food. All of our foods had gone through a real big process. So in the 50s, a lot of commercial things started to get into our food. And a lot of people think that you have to use all these processed things to give it flavor. But you know what? Our grandmother is just use whatever they had. So one of the things that I wanted was to have the opportunity in a restaurant would feature Puerto Rican, Dominican, and Cuban food without using any ingredient that was processed. We do everything from scratch in the restaurant. And I think that that is the best flavor that we can get from our Caribbean recipes, using everything fresh, not putting everything on the same taste just by using seasonings, that are not decided by us. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be preparing for us today and, and why you chose this to represent the restaurant. I chose this because this is one of the best sellers and people love it and come for it. And it has something to do with the Puerto Rican cuisine from the beginning and how it has evolved. I'm going to do mofongo. The first recipe of mofongo appeared in a book in the 1850s, and it was something completely different. It was just a way to get all the juices from a meat so you could do a second meal 
from the just one. So you did a stew, you ate that stew that day in whatever sauce was left, you boiled the plantains and you smashed them. And then you put a little bit of stock. That's a whole meal without using any meat. Now in the 60s, this restaurant in Yoyuda opened up with this recipe that was called mofongo relleno. And it was a patty of mofongo that was stuffed with a different stew. And that's where it all blew up. I don't think anybody knows about Puerto Rican food without knowing about mofongo. Everybody does it different. Even the new chefs are experimenting and doing some, you know, science things, which I admire and love. But I love the traditional. We have taken it a little bit, you know, for the restaurant. We're doing some variations, but it's all fresh and amazing. One of the most important things about doing a mofongo is this, the green plantain. And now the green plantain could be daunting to somebody that did not grow to with a green plantain um, plant in the backyard because usually everybody has one at home. <laughs> um, but I'm going to teach you how to peel a plantain and how to do it. And since we do the mofongo, if you don't do it at home, you can always find this amazing mofongo with coconut creole shrimps when you come to La Fabrica. Absolutely. And that's available for takeout as well, right? Yes, of course. Fantastic. You can enjoy it at home or you can enjoy it here with really good Latin American music. <laughs> I love it. Oh, fantastic. Well, let's see how you uh, how you do this without me losing a finger when I try it at home. <laughs> it's going to be easy, but one of the first things I'm going to tell you is you have to wear gloves when you're going to peel a plantain. The plantains have a sap that will give you a stain in your hands. Okay. And actually, there's something very funny. Puerto Ricans say that when you ha are Puerto Rican, you definitely show your plantain stain. It's something <laughs> that is emblematic. Yeah, la mancha de plátano. Okay. So every Puerto Rican will tell you, yes, I have my mancha de plátano. <laughs> and it's just because of that sap. We're going to cut the corners of the plantain. And then with a knife, we're just going to open it, make an incision and kind of like peel it, go it towards the other part of the plantain. Don't use something that is too sharp. I actually use this one that is sharp, but it's not like I can put some strength on it and it's not going to go through the plantain. I go in again and I go like this and again. And sometimes the plantains have been um, taken out from the plant a long time ago. They might be a little bit more difficult. I'll mm -hmm. give you a trick. Just put it in very warm water after you do this and it'll be a lot easier. And then with your hand, you go like this. You see, it's not that hard. And you peel it. This is all you need to know. All I can tell you is practice at home, and you'll be an expert pretty fast. See? Fantastic. This is it. Two seconds. Now, we have some already peeled here for you to make it faster. For mofongo, we are going to cut them in like one finger's width because we want to fry them pretty fast and we don't want to um, brown them. We just want like boil them in the, um, in the oil. And one thing, you're going to keep it in some salted water. That way the sap stays there and the plantain comes out a lot clearer when you're going to fry it. You know, yellower than yeah. dark. So now we are going to put the plantain in the oil. It's usually 340, but since this has water, don't be afraid if it goes up. As soon as it's already dry, it won't do that. Now, where did your where did your passion for cooking come from? Yeah, that sound. <laughs> I love that. You know, cooking is amazing. Cooking has every every sense on its compass, on its prism. Because when you hear that in Puerto Rico, you know there's something good coming up. And then you can see it, and you can smell it, and then you taste it, which is also the texture is going to be part of it. It's touching every sense. The only problem is that it's soon to be over after you eat it. But it's good because memories, if you have good memories when you ate something, you always have a good sense about what a recipe is. So this is being boiled in the oil, which is very important. And now I want to show you a pilon. 
Now, a pilon is a wooden mortar that has a big pestle and a big um, thing. Let me move the oil a little bit so we can see it. Wow. This is the pilon. This is where we're going to mash the plantain. But I'm going to be honest. If you don't have a pilon, which you can you can buy a small one, that's no problem. But that's not enough space to do um, plantains. So what I do sometimes, I just take a bowl and I take a pestle and I just do it in the bowl. So if you don't have a pilon, you can do it anyway at home if you have any kind of mortar with just a smaller uh, pilon. This is so emblematic of Puerto Rico that we're, there were some old ones that were called the newlyweds pilones, because it was such uh, an important present that was done. The trees were selected and they were done for every couple that was going to be uh, married. They would have their newlyweds pilon. And oh, I, I, and it's, a, yes, and it really depends on how much, you know, how much budget you had for it, what kind of a wedding it was. And you can find them in some antique stores. They're amazing. They have, you know, just looking at them, just the craftsmanship that they have when they're doing it. So for the mofongo, all we're gonna need is a little bit of garlic, salt, and butter. Um, at some times in Puerto Rico, it's done with oil, other times with margarine. I prefer butter, it gives it a good creamier um, taste and it's just really wonderful for it. So let me start taking out the plantains and check if they're ready. One of the things with the plantain, you'll notice they'll start losing their weight. And that means when they lose their weight, that they're almost ready. One of the things that I do just to check, I take one and I smash it. And when you smash it, if it doesn't have any, uh, it's kind of shiny, it's ready. One of the things, if you have this kind of fryer where you cannot monitor the, um, the temperature, all you have to do is turn it on until it gets really hot and just turn it up and nice. that oil is going to be hot enough to do your plantains they come to the top because they've lost all of their weight so now i'm just gonna take them out usually in puerto rico they don't strain them and maybe i'm doing this because i'm going little by little but usually they just put it in the pilon as soon as they're out of the of the oil I'm doing less quantity than the recipe calls just because I'm doing this for the demo. But one of the things, follow the recipe and you'll know exactly how much plantains. It's really funny. I have to sometimes, even for six people, do double the amount of mofongo because everybody asks me for more. <laughs> so I always end up doing more. So you have to realize how much you really want for your family. Now that we have the plantains, we're going to go to the pilon. And I'm just going to drop them there. Usually every pilon is already seasoned. Um, that means that we have used it with garlic and with oil and with salt. The salt is going to help also that it's not slippery in there. Let's put some salt. Okay. The garlic. Very important. In here, the restaurant, what we do is we do a garlic butter. Ooh. So it just really takes that flavor. And when we add the butter, mm, it has That's that sweet. garlic smell. And it blends very good. Then a little bit of butter. And now we just start smashing. It's a great workout, too. Everyone needs to be exercising in, in, in uh, 2020 quarantine era. So that's a good bicep move. <laughs> oh, definitely. It's a really good workout. <laughs> and we just move it. Oh, my God. This is amazing. So now, now that we have it ready, let me get another glow because I'm going to form it with my hand. Let me get the other one and the plate and then we're going to start working with the creole sauce which is also a very traditional recipe and with coconut it's sublime sublime okay now this is the mofongo and we're going to form it some people mold it i like it busted 
it really doesn't matter. The thing is that it's going to take all that sauce with the shrimps. Because plantains, because it has so much starch, it kind of starts getting a little bit harder. Sure. And with the sauce and the plants and the shrimps, it's just going to dissolve in your mouth. So there we have already the mofongo. Now we can start working on the sauce. Fantastic. Now let's go to the hot steam. Okay. This is my other station here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is this sauce. It's very funny when I was planning this class, my sous chef was saying, Why are you gonna do the Creole sauce? It takes so long and it's complicated. And I said, You know, it's really not complicated. Then he looked at me and he said, You know, you're right, it's really not complicated. It's very easy and it's just fresh ingredients, which we're just gonna um, cook for a little while so it gets all that flavor. Is the combination here we're going to start with a little bit of olive oil i like extra virgin olive oil because it gives a fruitiness to the to the recipe especially the italian though is in puerto rico and the caribbean islands is more the spanish one <coughs> now i'm going to add some onions chopped and really a lot of everybody in puerto rico has their own recipe about this and I'll tell you, everybody has the best recipe. I'm not going to compete with any aunt or grandmother because there is something beautiful. So if you see something that you want to add or take out, feel free. Organic recipe, nothing in stone. Now, garlic, green pepper. In Puerto Rico, we use Cubanel peppers. Here in the restaurant, I mix bell peppers because of the color and, and some Cubanel peppers. And if you want to make it hot, because I had a friend who asked me, you can use poblano peppers or you can use some jalapenos while you're doing it. So the Puerto Rican food is not really hot. It's spicy with flavor, but not with heat. So we make the best PK in the world, so you add it to your taste. And actually, we make here one in the restaurant with habaneros and pineapple that is amazing. Ooh. So you have to try it also. Okay, here I have the onion. The garlic, the peppers. When they start shining, you're gonna add fresh tomatoes chopped. Now we're gonna add some flavoring, two bay leaves or one, it depends on the size, and a little bit of oregano. Now, of course, in everything that you're doing, some people say we shouldn't add too much um, salt. You have to add salt. You have to add a little bit of salt on each layer so it gets the flavor out and you end up using less salt than waiting till the end and just getting the flavor out right. so it's better to monitor it little by little now sense. i'm gonna add the tomato paste a lot of people say it has to be tomato sauce tomato sauce comes from tomatoes and things that were out in the in the fire until they're dried out that's why it was seasoned but it's better if you season it yourself with your oregano, the bay leaves, the onion. You put some tomato paste, let it mix so it gets all those flavors and water. This is all. Uh, I can smell it from Fresh here. Flavors. I'm <laughs> yeah. I oh, God. That's the best thing about cooking, getting all those smells around. <laughs> Now we're just going to let it cook until it really boils. And you should let it cook at least like some three to four minutes so it's really bubbly. And then after it's bubbly, you can turn it off and let it steep there with a little bit of red roasted peppers. That comes from Spain. We can't take that out. And the olives, which I chop because... My kids, when they were growing up, they didn't want to see whole olives. And they said, Mom, I'm so glad you're doing the sauce without olives. Little did they know. They were just <laughs> chopped. But the flavor is there. It's very important for the end taste of this sauce. So we're going to let it work there just one second while I look for the one that I have already done. And I want you to see the thickness of it. So you see all the flavors are there. Oh. Here we don't chop the olives. We have them in rounds. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still chop them for your kids, or, or are they over that now? <laughs> now? Actually, my son is my sous chef here, so he cooks and now eats everything. And he's actually 
excellent. He's more organized than me. I have to uh, accept it. I'm a creative. <laughs> uh, sometimes a hurricane, <laughs> all with too much um, sentimentality. But he always takes everything and put it very, very well organized. I so I think we make a good combination here in the restaurant. A good team. And so he's trying to do some new things. So now that this sauce is almost ready, we can finish the dish and start doing the um, the shrimp. So let me just take all this out one second. Well, Scott, how long ago have you had some Puerto Rican food? It's been too long. It's been much too long. Yeah, you have to stop by. Now on Fridays, we have the traditional pernil and arroz con gandules, which is a pigeon pea rice that is amazing with pernil. And only the smells of that night just will remain, remind everybody that has been on Christmas in Puerto Rico. They're going to be reminded for that. So I can't yeah. wait to do now the topping because when you see the shrimps going down that mofongo. Mm -mm. Okay, this is how we started here. Okay, uh, I have the shrimps, which I'm just going to season with a little bit of salt. I had two portions of shrimps here because I wanted them to really, you would be able to see everything. Okay, now let me put a little bit of olive oil. And first I'm going to cook the shrimp. Now, you also have uh, a fantastic live music program at the restaurant. Has that still been going on right now, or how does that work? Well, right now, we, we haven't done it. Um, we are working on it because, remember, we have a club in the back, and we have the tables there, and we are just trying to coordinate how we can start doing some of the live music. I think people miss it. It's, um, I always used to say that you could tell somebody from the Caribbean because if something smelled or a sound came from the kitchen, they would go, oh, oh what, what? <laughs> I'm having food? And, or music, because their feet would be going like this. It's, it's part of our heritage. So we do want to bring back the live music so people can really enjoy it. Even though we can't dance like before, they can get that swing and then dance at home. You can still move the in your seat. Thing when you're, yeah, yeah. Now, the important thing with the shrimp is you want them to start turning a little bit pinkish when they stop being that shiny and they start changing color, they're almost ready. And this is the easy part. Now, let me tell you something about this recipe if you're doing at home. You can do this sauce like one week before. It'll keep in the refrigerator very well you know save like here with a top it was beautiful so you can do this before and when your guests come or when you're ready to cook then you can do it all at the same time and not be that long in the kitchen i almost have it water now here we have the coconut milk and now we're gonna let it cook until it gets a little bit thickened by the coconut sauce now something very important that we chefs hate to do is you got to try it you got to always try what you're cooking mm. Mm -mm. Mm. it's really getting there oh my god mm. i wish i could volunteer to help on that front <laughs> don't worry we do it to go so we'll send you to go all right there we go a care package. <laughs> but you see how the sauce starts tur turning pink and the shrimp finish to cook, finish cooking with the sauce. So they take all that flavor. And that's very important. So they can really, you know, when you take the first bite, just take everything out. And then when the sauce is ready, usually what we do in the restaurant, we do by order. Nothing is pre-done. Only the things that can be pre-done are pre-done everything else we keep see how it's thickening only because of the coconut milk now we put the first part of the shrimps mm. and now the most important part which is the sauce 
Oh my god. Yum. Yeah. And we put enough sauce because one of the things that mofongo has, mofongo is dry because of the um of the same starch that the plantain has. But the most important thing is the taste. So when you mix that sauce with the with the mofongo, it's just perfect. Gorgeous. And this is it. Mofongo with shrimps. You can decorate it with a little bit of cilantro at the end. Fantastic. Looks amazing. I wish I could share it with you right now, but I know soon enough I'll be able to swing by, grab some takeout, and, and try it for myself. And right now as well, there is also outdoor seating at the restaurant as well, right? I know the weather's getting a little cooler, but we're still doing that. Yeah, no, we're still doing it, and we have the heaters. We have the outside heaters. For this time, it's just perfect because you can keep whatever sweater you have on and you don't have to start taking it all off. So it's the, actually the outside is beautiful. And it, it's been really pretty lately. So why not enjoy the outside sitting? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So let me just put a little bit more sauce here because I see this going down. <laughs> and let's go to our drink because now we're gonna talk about Coquito. Yes, please. A little, a little cocktail to uh, to finish this all off. Yes, but well, coquito is traditionally done with rum. But when you have a liquor that you really like, it's a good idea to make your own version. So today we're gonna use Maker Smart, and we're gonna use the bourbon. So I'm doing a bourbon coquito, and I want to tell you a little bit about the story about coquito because I think it's so funny and so interesting. You know, anybody that has known a puerto rican or has or has family that's puerto rican they definitely have received a coquito for christmas we give it as a gift it's one of the traditional drinks that we have when people start going to your house as caroling and and singing and you always you always want the coquito now the coquito has a story because in the caribbean we are the only ones that do it with coconut milk and it comes up because in the safra which is when you take the sugar cane down that's exactly at that time they would celebrate of course the owners of the haciendas would celebrate with wines with different añejo um, rums or things like that but the farmers would celebrate with this concoction that would do with molasses with coconut milk tons of spices and moonshine and moonshine is called in puerto rico pitorro or cañita and it's just you know it's a tradition used in the coquito now during the prohibition it was a lot of fun because we were not supposed to use any alcohol and now using um the coquito helped us get away with alcohol the thing is the eggnog was used in the american houses and it was okay because it was a virgin eggnog so puerto rico started saying you know if I do coconut milk using the cañita or the moonshine, the fat of the coconut will take the smell away. You know, that aroma that the rum has. So that's how they started again, reviving this mixture of coconut, spices, and rum to have, be able to celebrate also with a little bit of the coconut eggnog. But they used to say, no, it's just coquito, it's virgin. So I'm gonna do... The version that we have in the restaurant and it's a lot of fun first i'm going to prepare the glass the glass i'm going to put a little bit of orange which gives it a good flavor actually um sometimes i put a little bit of um of um of orange rinds when i'm doing and curing the same maker smart bourbon so we'll give a little bit of orange flavor that works beautiful with this and then i'm going to put some coconut toasted coconut and sugar on the top okay and now let's start the drink now it depends on how you like it i don't like it too sweet so i do two ounces of coconut milk One ounce of coconut cream, and this is where the sugar is going to be. So 
first one. If you like it sweeter, just put a little bit more. Now, I'm going to use the bourbon. Maker's Mark 46. You know, Coquito always takes a lot of care, and it's exactly the tradition that Maker's Mark has in the care that they use. A family tradition. Mm. Now, you can do it also with a mixture of both. And now all we are going to do is move it. Well, the spices, huh? Now we're going to put a little bit of vanilla. Cinnamon. I'm stirring it. Some people like it shaken. In this particular one, I like it stirred. And now I'm going to serve it. I love that sound of a stirred cocktail. That's always a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just back to tradition. If you want, put a little bit more cinnamon or nutmeg. Um, this is it. And like we say in Puerto Rico, muchas felicidades. And we start even before Thanksgiving with the coquito. Well, cheers to I'm that. I don't have a cocktail, but I'm drinking some Maker's Mark myself on the just on the rocks. You know, it's really, really good. If you like it sweeter, just remember with the coconut cream. I just like it like this. It's a beautiful drink for after dinner, just sitting down, talking about everything, life after dinner. This is just perfect. And you can do it in bottles, have it refrigerated, and use it as a gift. Absolutely. And that's a great thing around the holidays, too, for folks to know that you can, this is a cocktail you can make in advance so that it can be a gift. If you're having a party, you don't have to spend all that time, you know, mixing and not being able to socialize with your guests, etc. Not at all. Actually, one of the things that we do in Puerto in here in the restaurants, we have the mixture of the coconut already done. And that mixture, then we mix it with the Maker Smart Bourbon. And then you have the drink. It's really, really good. And it brings you back home or it brings you back to whoever you have met during your lifetime that has offered you coquito. Absolutely. And I have to say, thank you so much for sharing um, some of the history of the food and the drink that we're enjoying. Because I think it's so much, it tastes that much better when you know a little bit about the history and you understand where it's coming from and what sort of went into it. Well, I always think that when you're introducing a new place with your food that's very traditional, you just have to be very honest about that tradition. And honesty in that tradition means you can say a lot of people do it differently. We're trying to do it, you know, in a certain way that will bring you back to Puerto Rico or take you to Puerto Rico. You know, if we would sit down at every country's table and just taste their food, I think we would have peace all over again. Because really, the best way to know about a country is with their food. It tells you about the history, the culture, and their care that they had about what they grew and who was going to be nurtured with that. Uh, and I think Puerto Rico is a straight line on that. Absolutely. Oh, cheers to that. Nothing, no other message we need to hear right now more than that, I think. Let's all come together over food, over drink, whether we're doing it around our kitchen table or just doing it virtually over Zoom. Hey, there's no other better way to learn from each other, share and bond. Well, I have I have family all over the states, and I have family in Puerto Rico, and sometimes we just met each other when I went there for celebrations and things like that. And I gotta be honest, even in these times, we're getting more connected. We are talking everywhere at the same time. We have cooking sessions. We have our nieces, our you know the grandsons. My mother is there, who's 91. And it's been a pleasure to actually have all those meetings that sometimes we couldn't have. So we have to look at the bright side, how we can still enjoy the good things of life and still protect ourselves. Couldn't agree more. And thank, thanks to you, we have all the guidance that we need to make these dishes and these cocktails that we can share in whatever way makes the most sense for us right now. And we've seen why you had a cooking show for 20 plus years. <laughs> I mean, this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Giovanna. Thanks to you for having me. I loved it and I want to extend an invitation. If you have other things that you would like to try from our Caribbean islands, don't forget La Fabrica. And if you have anything to ask, just ask for me. I'm usually in the kitchen and if I'm there, I'm gonna come out and talk to you. So. 
come to la fabrica and keep on enjoying coquita with maker's mark and mofongo with the coconut shrimps oh my god we also do it with lobster which is amazing also Ooh. what can i say <laughs> That sounds fantastic. Well, I will be there to share that with you, lift a drink in person, and maybe even dance for a moment. I think, you know, we'll be able to do that again yeah. very, very soon. So thank well, you. We have enough space, so you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it on my chair. I'm a pretty free spirit, you know, what can I say? Um, okay. Thank you so much, Giovanna. And, and to our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. We can't wait to see you tomorrow. For our finale, it's a wine and cheese pairing with Natalie Powerhouse Team, Haley Fortier, and Christy Weiss. There's still time to order your cheese and wine from Natalie, by the way, so that you can follow along. So visit Natalie's online menu, order the Boston Magazine wine and cheese pairing, and we will see you tomorrow. Thanks so much for tuning in.